Everything okay? Okay, so let's start. My name is Grintold. Uh, I've traveled a long way from the internet to be here um, to tell you something about flow graphs, which is uh, one of my favorite UI components uh, throughout there. And uh, my talk is split into four sections. Uh, first, I will tell you where you meet uh, flow graphs everywhere outside uh, the technological world, outside of computers. And uh, then I'm going to uh, analyze an existing flow graph implementation, um, give you a short overview of what a flow graph is capable of and uh, how we can implement them. Afterwards, we'll have a look into libgtk flow, which is a library uh, for uh, GTK to use flow graphs in GTK-based applications. And at the, at the finishing, we will uh, discuss uh, what we can do with them, in, especially in GNOME, um, because there are some marvelous outlooks. So let's start. First of all, flow graphs, uh, even if you've never heard of them, are pretty familiar to almost anyone. They feel natural to the user. Uh, why? Because uh, I bet any one of you has already seen one. Anyone who's ever had a fact book in their hands has seen a flow graph. For example, this is uh, a graphic of uh, electron transport chain. Um, it comes from the biochemical uh, sectors and it describes how electrons are transport, uh, through, uh, transported uh, by doing different peptide reactions or something. So I have a flow from uh, input to output, basically. Or another one. This is a sewing plant, um, uh, the schematic uh, plan of a sewing plant. At the left you can see there is input. Then the input is processed by different components of the system. And uh, there are different outputs. Like here they produce energy from the waste or, uh, and they produce clean water and they produce uh, fertility agents from this. Or there's another one. Um, this is uh, from a game called Big Pharma. Um, here we see a production chain, which is also a flow graph. You have inputs from the, from the left, there are coming some crystals uh, in that are processed and they walk through different machines and each machine changes uh, the type of um, yeah, it changes uh, what, the, uh, what the, the, the data is. And then it gets packaged and uh, then it flows out again. So we have different stage, uh, stages that, um, that uh, transform, mix, split up uh, what we give them. And so we can model processes. And flow graphs have already arrived in our midst. For example, this is an application based on GTK, which is called GNU Radio. Are there any radio enthusiasts in here? Oh, a little. <laughs> uh, GNU Radio is an application which is uh, meant to take a signal from an antenna, run it through different uh, processing uh, units, uh, for example, uh, noise reduction components or uh, decoders, so that we have uh, at the input a simple um, two-dimensional signal. One dimension is time, one dimension is the amplitude, um, and we generate uh, modularly, uh, modularly, we generate useful data, or what is useful for us from it, and we allow the user to uh, actually decide how the components are, uh, are managed. And this is uh, basically what a flow graph in software is. So we have another example, this time uh, really from, uh, from a GNOME project. This is Conduit. Uh, Conduit is an application that is meant to synchronize uh, data from different sources to different targets. For example, if I have uh, uh, two folders and I want to have um, I want to have them synchronized, I tell uh, Conduit to do so. And this is the first graph. And uh, in the second graph, he's, uh, for example, taking data from FSpot, the photo manager, and um, publishing uh, both, uh, uh, publishing the FSpot photos to both Picasa and Facebook at the same time. And for this, uh, he allows the user uh, to uh, do this with a flow graph. Another nice application that I found is uh, from the CAD sector uh, for com computer-aided design. Um, this is a program by a guy called Matt Keeter. Um, it's called Antimony, and he uses flow graphs 
to actually model 3D models, which I find a pretty interesting concept. He uses, uh, for example, a cube node to generate a cube with a specific length, uh, width, and uh, depth. Uh, depth. <laughs> and uh, then he creates a circle, which has a specific radius, a specific height, and uh, runs it through a difference node. So uh, take the cube, um, subtract the volume of the of the of the circle of the uh, of the cylinder, and then you get this output. So you can uh, model really really complex structures by only using um, nodes from uh, from a flow graph. Um, I think now it's a little bit clearer what a flow graph is, even if you haven't ever uh, encountered them in software. Um, so um, we'll go on and analyze an existing implementation, which is uh, the most complete implementation, I think, that there is to be found in the world of free software. And it comes from a tool called Blender. Um, Blender is a 3D modeling tool. Most of, them, most of you should be familiar with it or, or at least heard of it, maybe, because it's uh, been around a very, very long time in the world of free software. And this is uh, Blender's node editor. Blender uses nodes to do everything that has to do with post-processing. For everyone who doesn't know, um, in Blender uh, you put in 3D objects and uh, model them how you want to look them, uh, how you want them to look, and then you, um, active, uh, you go into a process called rendering, where there is the three data actually trend, uh, compiled into a 2D image that we can publish. So I model my uh, animation, and uh, then I have a sequence of images, uh, which is my animation, and from that I can create a video file or whatever. Post-processing is a step that happens after rendering. After rendering, I'm able to uh, get at the left side the input, the raw image that you get from your rendering process, and I'm able to apply uh, multiple filters that uh, filters like in GIMP, uh, you can add a blur or you can add, um, yeah, you can do motion, uh, motion blur, you can uh, change the colors or whatever you like. Uh, you can split the image into multiple components, you can split the c uh, color components from each other and then uh, mix them together uh, to achieve different effects. And the first thing we see is uh, the central component is uh, the node, something like this, and nodes have inputs and outputs. Data goes into a node, gets transformed somehow, and then generates output. The second thing we see is uh, there are nodes that only have outputs, they are generating data, and there are nodes that only have inputs, they are consuming data, they are our tar uh, targets. and. Uh, then we can see another interesting feature. They, uh, these, um, these inputs and outputs have different types. They're, they have different colors. That means I can only con interconnect uh, the docs or uh, these inputs and outputs if they have the same type. So there is a type system in there. The third thing we uh, see is, yeah, there are connections. It's maybe the most obvious one, but uh, we can let the user decide which uh, input to connect with uh, uh, which output. Then another thing we see is we have um, something like here. We have uh, factors that apply directly on the input. Uh, we can manipulate the, uh, the input and output. Uh, so then uh, I have a second screenshot, which shows us what we cannot do. And this is, for example, here. When we try to connect uh, the output of one node to the input of another, and then again the output of that node to the original node, we get a red line that tells us, nope, nope, you can't do that. that this is uh, one restriction. But of, uh, but of course it gets clear. If uh, this one triggers, uh, there is no real input and uh, there is nothing uh, where this could go. So we always want to, pr uh, to model a process from, output to in uh, from input to output. Okay, let's do a little conclusion. Nodes can create, transform, or consume data. 
nodes receive and send data via inputs and outputs. Inputs and outputs may be chained via connectors. Inputs and outputs may have different incompatible types. The flow graph is a direct acyclic graph. It has no uh, circular connections. And another one uh, is we have a special null value. Because um, what happens if a node like this is, uh, must have inputs? Because otherwise, if it uh, didn't have those inputs, it can't, uh, it can't create uh, output that makes actually sense. So uh, there are possible solutions to this is uh, either defining a default value for each input that, uh, that is taken when there is no, uh, no output node connected to the input, um, or we can uh, have a special null value that invalidates uh, an, an, an input so we can uh, adjust the behavior to that. Now let's go on. Uh, we have uh, uh, something to discuss and this is libgtk flow. libgtk flow is uh, my attempt to get flow graphs standardized into uh, into GNOME, uh, into the GNOME world or into the GTK world. Um, what we've seen, there are many implementations, uh, or why am I going to do this? Uh, there are many implementations that are already there, but they're all uh, kind of specialized for the application they're written for. There is no uh, general solution, like if you, if you code a coding app in, uh, in GTK, you're probably gonna, uh, going to use uh, libgtk source view. Um, and there's no default component. There's also nothing that reacts to uh, GTK-specific stuff like themes. Uh, when you have uh, uh, those implementations, they are always uh, look the same. Maybe they have their own themes, but they don't react to GTK themes. And I think this is not really cool. So um, I, th uh, I went and uh, started to implement a library uh, that respects those uh, environmental settings from every GTK user and uh, tries to act upon it. So I've compiled a quick fact sheet, answer the six, uh, six W's, uh, what it is. It's a library uh, that every uh, GTK application developer can use or should be able to use. Uh, the, when the first commit was uh, in May uh, 2015, there was some preliminary planning that I did, but this is the first commit, then it started. Where you can find the project at github.com slash Grintol slash libgtkflow, but there will be a QR code at the end, so you don't have to remember this now. Um, who? Um, it was in the, in the beginning, it was just me. Then when the library grew to, uh, to be somewhat presentable, I posted it to the Vala mailing list and the GTK mailing list. And some people found this pretty cool. And uh, there was one in, uh, one is a special person. Uh, it is Isildan or Daniel Espinosa. He contributed uh, like the build system. Uh, he moved the build system from CMake to AutoMake and helped me with uh, very cool stuff. Uh, he helped me plan the API. My API was kind of sucky, and he designed a better one. And we discussed a lot, and we had a lot of fun developing this. Why? Because we love flow graphs. How? Uh, with the programming language Vala. Um, thanks to Jörg, Bill uh, Jörg Bill Billiter here for designing a really cool pro programming language for the GNOME project. Um, GTK, of course, and a pinch of G-Object introspection, which I'll come back later to. Um, so, after Isildan uh, did his uh, comments, we decided that uh, libgtk flow should actually be two libraries. There is, now there's Gflow. Gflow models uh, is the abstract model of the data flow. And there's G a GTK flow. GTK flow uh, manages all the graphic stuff, displaying the flow graph to the user. So you feed uh, GTK flow with objects that are uh, from Gflow. Let's have a little look at the stack. Um, if you watch only the right side, this is your typical GTK application. You have your application code. Your application code talks to GTK. And GTK calls. Uh, talks to GDK, and uh, GDK talks to the backend, whatever you have in your system, X, Wayland, whatever. Uh, with libgtk uh, GTK flow, your applica uh, application talks to GTK flow in order to uh, create nodes, uh, docs, um, connections, 
uh, and everything, and then you feed those objects into GTK flow. GTK flow will uh, talk with the drawing methods of GTK, uh, thus ensuring that themes and so on are, uh, are respected and correctly drawn. And uh, then the cycle will go on. So um, there are actually two purposes uh, in, in such a flow graph library. We have uh, the first purpose, which is uh, supplying topological information. So we can ask the flow graph uh, who is uh, connected with whom and uh, to traverse the graph to get information from the user input. And the second one is the actual transformation of data, the actual flow of data through the graph and how the data is manipulated uh, throughout the graph. So um, I'll outline the most important classes and interfaces that the library uh, will give you if you start programming with it. The first and most important class, uh, of course, is the node. And uh, the node will contain docs. Doc is the uh, head, uh, head word for, uh, for input and output. So we uh, use terminolo uh, terminology from, um, from GStreamer to keep it a bit familiar. Uh, our outputs are called source and our inputs are called sync. And also the method names uh, should overlap. They're called link and unlink to link sources and uh, syncs to each other to get a little bit familiarity in here for people who are already using other components of the GNOME stack. Um, then there is uh, oh, an arrow. <laughs> then there is GTK flow. GTK flow exports uh, the node view. Node view is a GTK widget which you can place in your application, like a button or like the tree views, and uh, you feed the node view with uh, the objects from GFlow, and then it will render them accordingly. Um, uh, it also exports two interfaces, which are now uh, abstract classes, but they are uh, meant to be interfaces in the future. Uh, the node renderer and the doc renderer, which allows you to do stuff like this. These in the middle are rendered by the default uh, do uh, node renderer uh, supplied by GTK Flow. And those at the sides are custom implementations of a node renderer, which is application speci uh, specific. This, uh, uh, application, for example, has these um, connectors from the Raspberry Pi, and uh, no normal node will draw something like this. So with the node renderer and the doc renderer, you can actually implement it to look what you want it to look like. So it, it's pretty flexible here. So uh, we'll have a little look at the code. This is a small example, which you will also find on GitHub, uh, finished uh, and implemented. This is a program that basically takes, uh, the, these are nodes which basically generate a numeric value as output, um, then do an addition operation on them and uh, put it out in an output node. It's uh, as easy as it can get. It's basically the hello world example for libgtk flow. So I'll uh, walk you through as fast as I can. This is uh, the first thing you have to do this add node. Uh, we will only uh, be in the inside this, uh, this node here. So uh, the first thing is we, um, we write an, an, an add node class definition. Then uh, we'll initialize it with, uh, with the things and sources that we need. This one is a bit special because in the start, it only has a source and with these add and remove buttons, I can dynamically uh, remove and add things uh, uh, on runtime, which is pretty cool and makes it also uh, very flexible. Um, so we define a source for our node and we give it a name in, the, uh, in those three lines here. And then we say self add source. This means, hey node, you now have a new source and it is this object. Then we'll create uh, those buttons. Uh, and, uh, I think this is pretty straightforward. We have an add button and a remove button connected, hook it up to the uh, signals, and then we're basically already done. Um, these are the two methods that uh, act upon uh, the pressing of add and remove. So they basically um, only generate on every click, uh, you click add, it generates a simple sync, and sets it, uh, gives it a name, 
adds it to the node and connects it to a signal, which is pretty important, is changed. Every time uh, uh, the value that is being uh, submitted into a, uh, into a sync, this signal will trigger and we can act upon this signal uh, to generate a new out output for the source. So then we have uh, the method which uh, this change signal is linked to. It's linked to do calculations. And do calculations basically iterates over, over all the um, source, uh, all the things that we created for this node, adds, uh, adds up the values, and checks if there are uh, if there are valid values. Because when we have an, a non-defined value, we cannot create a useful result. And if everything fits, it writes the result of the calculations into the result. Uh, here, result is our uh, output uh, doc that we made. So, what's still missing? Um, we have, of course, uh, not everything that we want to have in this library. For example, as there was this update to GTK3.20, uh, the foreign drawing methods uh, compa uh, compatibility kind of broke. We used them to do the theme uh, stuff. And uh, it's one of my ta uh, aims for this conference to get some time and rewrite it so it will work with uh, versions greater than 3.20. Um, users of uh, Debian Stable or something should be fine with trying out everything and compile the examples and so on. Um, what we want to do is marking and moving multiple nodes. Uh, as you can imagine, it gets a uh, use, it would get a little bit uh, stressy if you have many, many nodes and you have them in groups and whatever. So we want to drag a frame, then um, uh, all the nodes get marked and you can drag and drop them at once. Then uh, we want to introduce an own connector class so we can make named connections and stuff like that. Performance has to be optimized. Um, Wid uh, to set widgets as doc labels would also be nice, and for people who use uh, left, uh, right to left scripts like Hebrew or Arabic, it would be nice to have the whole graph reversed, so um, people uh, don't have to adapt to Western standards. So uh, the last thing is recursion. In some cases, uh, we remember the screenshot of Conduit. It makes sense to actually uh, interconnect two nodes directly with each other. And it's only dangerous if the, so, uh, the input value uh, influences the output value. So we should uh, try to respect cases uh, where this is not uh, like that. So the last thing I want to talk about is marvelous outlooks. What do we actually? What should we actually use this for? Um, actually, I planned to do mockups, but I didn't, because um, if I told you how to implement, <laughs> if I told you how to do it, I would probably um, influence you, and maybe you will come up with a much cooler way to do uh, graphs in, in GNOME. Applications that I find interesting are, for example, PTV. This is the video uh, video editing project. Uh, do post-processing uh, processing for them with libgtk flow. Or matching audio sources uh, to audio syncs in, um, uh, in Pavu control or something like that. Um, Talk to me. I'm uh, there for three days. Uh, if you have any ideas, talk to me. There is much we can do with it. Basically, every time we have to let the user model a process, we can use flow graphs. Thanks for your attention. This is uh, where you can find libgtk flow. Fork, use, push, star, do whatever. I'm looking forward to getting in contact with you. So. Are there any questions, or do we have time? <laughs> if there are questions, then it's break time, so it's probably best to do them at the break, because everyone's going to disappear anyway. So. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much so for the thank talk. thank you very much for your attention. Mm.